Hello. I made a previous video about modular arithmetic, but it's such fun, I've decided to make another one. Um, so uh, some fairly lightweight, um, amusing things to start with, and then I'll move on to something a little more substantial, which is the famous and ancient Chinese remainder theorem. So this is my title. And we start with a, a recap. So I'm gonna use Z to mean the integers, the ordinary integers, positive and negative, which we can add and subtract in the usual way. And I use Zn, which means the integers mod n, which we can add and multiply according to some tables that look like this. This is the example for n equals five. Um, so if that all makes sense to you, you're good to go. Um, if this is, uh, it all seems like gobbledygook, then I suggest you might want to watch my previous video to get you up to speed. Uh, one more little bit of recapping. Um, in Z10, for example, seven plus three equals zero. Um, and so we can write this thing here, but I'm pronounce that, mi pronounce that minus three, not negative three. Negative three is a number that's in Z. Um, it's not in Z10. Uh, there's only the numbers naught to nine in Z10. There is a number that if you add it to three, you get naught and that's seven. And that is, if you like, is the unary minus applied to three, or you can think of it as naught minus three. Anyway, I pronounce this minus three, not negative three. Okay, so my first example is about subtracting ordinary integers um, using pencil and paper or in your head. Um, now, you wouldn't really normally do an eight digit example in your head, would you? But I'll do this just to illustrate the method. Um, there are lots of ways of subtracting. Um, almost all of them start from the right. In fact, I suspect there are some of you who think you can't start from the left, but you can. And, and I prefer to do it that way. But it relies on mod 10 arithmetic. So uh, let's have a go at that. In fact, you can do the digits in any order you like. So it's not terribly likely that you want to start from the fourth from the left, but that's what I'm gonna do here just to illustrate the method. So what we do is we imagine splitting the numbers up like this. So this number is that one plus that one. And of course this one is that one plus that one. So we want to do that minus that plus that minus that. Okay, so in this case, um, we can see at a glance that this number is less than that number. Now, we don't need to do subtraction and work out what the answer is here, but we know that this is going to be a small positive number, and that's not going to affect this answer here. And 3 minus 2, 3 minus 1 is 2. So here we say 3 minus 1 is 2, and that's smaller than that, so 2 it is. Okay, um, if this is a 1 and a 3 the other way around, then it's the same idea, but now 1 minus 3 is 8. Right, because we're working mod 10. We don't care what happens to the left of this example, but this is going to be an eight, isn't it? Because this is smaller than that and there's no carry or whatever. I'm sorry, it's an eight. And here we're going to say one minus three is eight, mod 10. Um, and this is smaller than that, so eight it is. Okay, now what happens if this number is bigger than that number? Well, when we subtract that from that, we get a negative number, but it's not a huge negative number. It's not as big as, um, minus 10, uh, negative 10,000, is it? And if you, in fact, imagine counting away, counting down from this difference here, you're going to go past one multiple of 10,000, but not two. So the answer is going to be one less than you first thought. So it's going to be one here. So here you say, well, three minus one is two, but that's bigger than that, so one. And the same here, exactly the same idea. So this would have been eight apart from this problem, so it's seven. So here we say one minus three is eight, but that's bigger than that, so seven. Okay, so let's see that in action. So we go, starting from the left, we go nine minus six is three, but that's bigger than that, so two. Three minus eight is five, but that's bigger than that, so four. Six minus seven is nine, that's smaller than that, so nine it is. Three minus one is two, but that's bigger than that, so one. Four minus four is naught, but that's bigger than that, so nine. We're working mod 10, remember. So we subtract one from the north and get nine. We don't worry about what goes on to the left. We've already done that. Okay, four minus six is eight. That's smaller than that, so eight it is. Eight minus three is five, but that's bigger than that, so four. And one minus nine is two. Okay, so that's how you do it, working from the left. Um, as I say, you're hardly ever going to do that with such big numbers. You use a calculator, wouldn't you? But um, it works very well uh, doing it mentally for, for two or three digit numbers. Now, why do I like that? Well, there's nothing to remember between the digits because they're, they're done sort of independently. Most importantly, really, the digits come out in the right order. So if you want to tell someone the answer, um, you tell them as you're working it out. You don't need to work them all out backwards. Remember the whole lot and then recite them out forwards. 
And also importantly, you can stop when you have enough precision. I mean, if you did face this thing mentally, you almost certainly wouldn't need all eight digits of the answer. You probably only want one or two. So you work from the left and stop when you've got the accuracy you need. Uh, the disadvantage is you do need to be fairly practiced at mod 10 subtraction. And also this critical thing about seeing, the, seeing at a glance whether this number is bigger than that number. Actually, humans are pretty good at that, although it seems like quite a complicated thing to do, but you can see it more or less instantaneously that that number is bigger than that. Right, um, but it makes it sort of interest that it's not really suitable as a computer algorithm, because, and it's for that reason, because how is a computer going to tell that that's bigger than that? Well, the answer is you're going to subtract that from that and see whether it's positive or negative. Well, if you're going to subtract that from that, you might have practically done the question anyway. You might as well start from the right, in other words. So computers always start from the right. Okay, next thing, tail of two triangles. Here's the first one. Um, this is called Sierpinski's triangle, and it's a fractal. You, know, you may have met fractals. So this one works like this. You take a triangle, actually any old shaped triangle will do, and you take the midpoints of all the sides and then draw this inside triangle and knock it out, so you're left with this bit. Um, and then you do the same again. You take those three black triangles and knock out the middle, and you do it again and again and again and forever. And if you do it forever, you get a shape that's sort of, um, well, it's fractal. Um, and it's a sort of fractal that's actually self-similar in the sense that um, if you zoom in on it, it always looks the same. And there we are, zooming in on it in all the left, bottom left-hand corner. Um, and it, it never gets simple, it never gets more complicated. It's just the same forever and ever. Okay, that's one triangle. The other one is this one, which I'm sure you haven't met before, it's Pascal's triangle which is all about counting things, isn't it? So this 15, for example, one of the things you can, it says is that if you want to choose two things from six, then there are 15 ways to do that. Lots of other applications of Pascal's trying to pops up all over the place, doesn't it? Um, now, uh, so we can do this uh, mod some number or other. Um, let's do it mod two. So that means we can replace all the even numbers by zero and all the odd numbers by one, and we get this pattern. And the other way to think about this is to actually calculate it in Z2. So here we calculate this one as that one plus that zero, and this zero is that one plus that one in Z2, and so on. Okay, so what do you notice about that pattern? It's the same as that one, right? You've got these triangles knocked out of the middle. Uh, so one of the things I love about mathematics is the strange and unexpected connections you get between different parts of the subject. So here we've got, we've got two triangles that they have in common. But this is, of course, an infinite triangle, but it's all about finite mathematics, it's about counting things, isn't it? Whereas this is a finite triangle, but it's all about the infinite. And this is about numbers and this is about geometry. And, you know, so what's the connection? Well, there's this deep, strange underground connection that goes through Z2. <laughs> I love that. Okay, most people know the divisibility test for nine. If you want to know if a number is divisible by nine, you add up all the digits and see if that's divisible by nine. Okay, well, then why does that work? So um, this number here is actually this one, isn't it? So it's E plus 10 lots of D and 100 lots of C and so on. Now, mod nine, uh, 10 is congruent to one, of course. And therefore, so is 100 because it's one squared. And so is 1,000, so is 10,000. So all of these numbers, these powers of 10, are congruent to one mod nine. And therefore, mod nine, this thing is congruent to this lot. So this method of adding up the digits doesn't just tell you whether it's divisible by nine, it actually tells you what its value is mod nine. And that, of course, is why it works as a divisibility test for three as well, because if this sum here is uh, divisible by three, also, but not nine, then this number is divisible by three, but not nine. OK, um, right, so we can do the same with 11. Uh, not quite so many people know the divisib divisibility test for 11, but it's very similar. So 10 is minus 1 mod 11, so 100 is plus 1, 1000 is minus 1, and so on. So this number is congruent mod 11 to this calculation. So you just add, add up the digits, but alternating signs. And again, this doesn't just tell you whether this number is divisible by 11, but it actually tells you what value it has mod 11. Now that's rather nice. Um, you can use that. Um, for checking calculation. So supposing you did this calculation, perhaps using a calculator, and you wanted to check that it was sensible, which of course you always should do. Uh, so one thing you can do is just check the size is reasonable, isn't it? So this is very roughly 40 times 40, which is 1600, and this is very roughly 1000. So 2600 is approximately right. So that's quite good. Okay, so you can use that check, but you can do more than that. So suppose you check it mod 11. 
Okay, well, let's do that. So 37 is 7 minus 3, which is 4 mod 11. 47 is 7 minus 4, which is 3 mod 11. So the product is 12, which is congruent to 1 mod 11. So this sum is 1 mod 11. And in the same way, this is, um, this is 8. Uh, that's minus 5, which is um, 6 mod, mod 11. And 8, 6 is a 48, which is 4 mod 11. So finally, 1 plus 4 is 5. So this side is 5 mod 11. What about this side? Well, it's 9 minus 8 plus 6 minus 2. That's 9, uh, 1, 7, 5. Yes, so it is. So it checks. So that's quite a powerful check. Of course, you can also check mod other numbers. So mod 10 is uh, useful, but it's, it only just checks the last digit, doesn't it? So let's just do that. So 7 times 7 is 9, plus 0 is 9. Yeah, that checks. So the last digit is right. And you can also check it mod 9, of course, because and that's very much like the 11 one, only, um, only you just add them all up. So uh, that's 1 mod 9, isn't it? And that's 2. So that is that whole thing is 2. That's 1. That's 5. The whole thing is 7. And here we get 8 plus, uh, eight, plus 8, 16, 25. Yeah, that is 7 uh, mod 9. I rather like 11, actually, um, as a check, because um, it's big enough that um, it catches quite a lot of errors. So um, I mean, if you only check mod, you know, a small number like three, then um, sort of a third of mistaken calculations will check anyway. Whereas at least with uh, 11, that's sort of 90 percent of, um, uh, of wrong errors will come out wrongly. But on the other hand, it's an easy, nice, easy check that what numbers are mod 11. To reduce mod 11 is nice and simple. And, and the sums you get are all ones you know. So we got, this is the worst one we got here, 86, but you know that, that's one of your tables. So working mod 11 uh, is very pretty. Now it turns out that if we've checked this calculation mod nine and mod 10 and mod 11, then we have in fact checked it mod 990. Um, well, why is that? Well, we've checked it mod nine. So if it's wrong, it's out by a multiple of nine. And similarly, if it's wrong, it's out by a multiple of 10. And also we've checked it mod 11. So if it's wrong, it's out by a multiple of 11. So if it's wrong, it's out by a multiple of 990. Um, and it clearly isn't because we know it's approximately 2,600. So it's never going to be something like 1,600 or 3,600. So it's actually wrong. We, we've proved that it's actually correct by checking the size and checking it mod 9, 10, 11. That's a nice segue into the Chinese remainder theorem. So um, what does Chinese remainder theorem? So well, let's do some checking first of all. You know what a prime number is? It's an integer bigger than one that has no factors other than one in itself. So two numbers are said to be co-prime if they have no common factor other than one. I.e., their HEF is one, highest common factor is one. So for example, 15 and 22, neither of them is prime, but they are co-prime because they have no common factor. And the key result we need here is that if they're co-prime, they're co-prime if and only if their lowest common multiple is their product. So here, um, if a number is to be a product of 15 and 22, uh, well, it has to be a product of 310, 330, doesn't it? Uh, because uh, it's got to have a multiple of 3 and 5 and 2 and 11. OK, right. Now then, let's say so we'll, we'll work towards this Chinese remainder theorem. So the first thing is, is probably very familiar. If something's divisible by 3 and it's also divisible by 8, then it's divisible by 24. Because 3 and 8 are co-primes, uh, and the least common multiple of 3 and 8 is 24. Right, so anything that's divisible by three and divisible by eight is divisible by the least common multiple. So let's turn that into uh, a statement using modular arithmetic. If, S, if X is congruent to zero mod three, which is just a fancy way of saying it's divisible by three, and X is congruent to zero mod eight, then it's congruent to zero mod 24. That's unexceptional. Now, what about if it's not zero in both cases? Suppose we know what X is mod three and mod eight. Can we work it out mod 24? It turns out we can. So uh, suppose it's um, 1 mod 3 and 5 mod 8, for example. So what could it be mod 24? Well, it's going to be 5 plus some multiple of 8. So it's either going to be 5 or 13 or 21. And of those, only 13 is 1 mod 3. So actually, there is just one answer mod 24, which is 1 mod 3 and 5 mod 8. And that's what Chinese remainder theorem says. So here's our uh, slightly fancier version of it. We have two co-prime numbers. And we have a number in M and N, and we have a number in ZM and a number in ZN. 
then there's a unique number in ZMN, the product, which is equal to A, congruent to A mod M and to B mod M. And that's exactly what this is saying here. Okay, now let's see how we can prove this. Um, what I'm going to do in this chart here is fill in all the numbers between 0 and 23 according to their value mod 3 and mod 8. So 0, of course, is 0 mod 3 and 0 mod 8. 1 is 1 mod 3 and 1 mod 8, and 2 is 2 mod 3 and 2 mod 8. Now 3, of course, is 3 mod 8, but it's 0 mod 3, so we go here. And then 4 and 5. And then we're going to go back 6 and 7. So you can see what's happening. We're going right, left to right and diagonally downwards. And when we hit this edge, we go across to here. And when we hit the bottom edge, of course, we go up to the top. So 8 is going to go here, isn't it? 8 is 2 mod 3, and it's 0 mod 8. So it goes there. And then we carry on doing the same trick. 9, 10, I don't know, 15. And so 16 is going to go here. And then the rest are going to go down here. And that's that. So we end up with one number in each square which is exactly what we want to be able to use this, this theorem. So if we know number is 1 mod 3 um, and 5 mod 8, then there is exactly one number in this square. There aren't two, there aren't none, there's precisely one, there's precisely one in every square. Right, now to help see how that happens, let's look at the case when the numbers are not co-prime. So 6 and 8 are not co-prime because they have a common factor of 2. Now, if we play the same trick and start writing 0, 1, 2, 3 down the diagonals like this, what happens is when we get 24, it goes back in this square. 24 is the least common multiple of, four and, of 6 and 8, but it's less than their, multiple, their product, which is 48. Um, so it goes here because it is a multiple of 6 and 8, and then we carry on again. So we end up with two numbers in, in, in half the squares and none in the others. So the Chinese and Roman Indian theorem isn't working here. Um, and you can tell it's never going to work. If these numbers are not co-prime, then their least common multiple is less than their product. And it's going to go here because the least common multiple is, is a multiple of six and a multiple of multiple of this number and of that number. And so it um, it is zero mod each, and so it goes here. So you're not going to get one number in each square whenever these numbers are not co-prime. And now you can see it's, that's never going to happen when they are co-prime, because suppose one of these squares had more than one number in it. Um, well, then this one, you'd go backwards. That would have to have two numbers in it as well, and that one and that one. And you'd work your way all the way back up to here, and this one would have to have two numbers in it. But anything that could go there is going to be a product of both this and this, um, and, their, and their least common multiple is, in fact, their product. So zero is the only one that goes there. So it always works with um, co-prime works numbers, and it never works with numbers that are not co-prime. OK, uh, now then, um, the problem with the Chinese remainder theorem, it tells you that there is a unique answer there, but it doesn't tell you what it is. And in fact, there isn't a terribly easy way to work out what it is. So let's take a slightly bigger example. So 9 and 14 are co-prime. Um, and supposing we wanted to find the number that was 8 mod 14 and 5 mod 9. Well, you can see from this chart that it's 50. Um, and we're looking for numbers up to 126, aren't we, which is the product of these two numbers. Um, now then, if you didn't... So how are you going to find this 50 if you've just given the 8 and the 5? Well, um, if you've got this big chart, of course, worked out, then you can just look it up. But of course, you won't have that normally. So one way to find it is to create this chart, of course. That's very hard work. Um, and if truth be told, there isn't a terribly quick way to do it. Um, so probably the best way to do it, if you're just doing it by hand, is to take the bigger modulus here, the 14. And so we're looking for a number that's 8 mod 14 and also 5 mod 9. So we take 8, and all the numbers that are 8 mod 14 are 8 plus some numbers of 14s. So we take 8 and repeatedly add 14 to it until we get a number that's... Um, that's 5 mod 9. So we take 8 and say, is that 5 mod 9? No. Add 14 to it, 22. Is that 5 mod 9? No. Uh, add, again, you get 36. Is that 5 mod 9? No, it's 0 mod 9, actually. Um, add 14 to get 50. Ah, oh, yes, that is 5, 5 mod 9. So that's probably the best you can do, really, which is not terribly pretty. Right, anyway, so that's the problem with the Chinese remainder theorem, which means applying the Chinese remainder theorem is not that easy. Right. Um, however, we haven't quite got to the full Chinese remainder theorem yet. We need to generalize it a little bit. And we're going back nearly 2,000 years to the first statement. So here is the original Chinese remainder theorem. 
I'll leave you to read it. Okay, so there are some things you might notice about this. Um, firstly, it isn't in Chinese. Well, it was originally. Um, secondly, um, it's not a theorem. It's a question. Well, there we go. We assume the author knew the theorem, but <laughs> that's why it's called the Chinese remainder theorem. Um, right, so the other thing you know is, of course, it's not soluble. It's a problem with no answer. So let, let's see what the problem is here. If we write it in uh, modern terms now, we're saying x is 2 mod 3, 3 mod 5, and 2 mod 7 mod 6. Well, you can't answer that, can you? Because 3, 5, and 7, they're all primes, actually, aren't they? So there's definitely the co-prime. Um, but um, their product is 105. So if x is any answer to this problem, then so is um, x plus 105. In fact, x plus any multiple of 105. Um, so the problem is oddly stated. Uh, but there we go. So let's see what the Chinese remainder, remainder theorem, as we now have it, says. So we have a bunch of co-prime moduli, not just two. Um, and the co-prime here means that no two of them have any common factor. And we have a value AI in each ZMI. And what the theorem says is that we can find a unique C in this thing where these are, this is the product of all the moduli, such that C is congruent to AI mod MI for every I. And, and you can see that does generalize what we've been doing, because if there are only two moduli, then this is exactly the theorem that we had before. And actually, this is quite easy to prove. Let's prove the original Chinese example. So um, we want to find a number that's 2 mod 3 and 3 mod 5 and 2 mod 7. Well, 3 and 5 are prime, so they're certainly co-prime. So we can work on these two together, and we get a number mod 15, won't we? which turns out to be 8. So 8 is 2 mod 3, and it's also 3 mod 5. 15 is not prime, but it is co-prime to 7. So now we can work on the 105 thing and find the number that's 8 mod 15 and 2 mod 7, and it turns out to be 23. Um, so we're using the fact repeatedly that um, when these numbers are co-prime, we can find a unique answer. And so there is a unique answer at the whole stage. And you can see that's going to work um, in bigger examples, can't you? So we start with this end, say, m m naught and m1 are co-prime. So we can find the unique answer in here that works for these two. Then we can add this one in and, and finally add that one in. So it's going to work. Okay, so turning back to the sort of um, frivolous and joyful mathematics that I enjoy most, um, we're not going to find a serious application of this. I'm going to talk about uh, counting. I just like counting things, really. It's, it's a bit, uh, bit geekish, isn't it? But there we go. If I'm waiting at a bus stop, I was likely not, does not count the windows in the building opposite. So I'm going to count the windows in this red building, uh, but it's a bit dull just to count one, two, three, four, blah, 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 blah. So I'm going to count the mod three, mod four, and mod five, and then um, check, uh, and then use the Chinese remainder theorem to work out how many there are. Yeah, sorry, that's really the sort of thing I do. Okay, so let's count the mod three. So we can forget about mod three. So those go away, those go away. That's one mod three, and another one is two. That lot goes away. Um, um, that's another one, another one for those four. That's got us up to zero mod three, and those go away. So it's zero mod three. Now four, it's quite subtle because this whole lot is zero mod four, isn't it? We've got four identical columns, um, and this is two mod four. So it's two mod four. So now we can work out what it is mod 12, and that turns out to be six. Uh, right, now we do mod five. It's a little bit more complicated. So we've got one, two, uh, this lot goes away because these are columns of five. Uh, three, four for these lower sixes. And then each of that lot is five. So it's four mod five. So then we can work out what it is mod 60. And that turns out to be 54. That's a little bit of a calculation, isn't it? So you take zero, six mod 12, as I suggested, with the, starting with the bigger one. So it's either going to be six or 18. Um, or whatever it is, six or 18 or 30 or 42 or 54. And that's the one that's four mod five. Okay, so there you go. Um, that's modular arithmetic part two. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>